your Bibles open there to Hebrews. She read Hebrews chapter 4. Let's look at this again. Beginning with Hebrews 4.15, Paul introduces us to Christ as our great high priest. Now before that, in the book of Hebrews, he introduced us to Christ as our Savior. Now listen, because this is very important. Make sure that you understand what I'm saying. Listen to it carefully. Hear the whole thing through. It's not enough just to know Jesus as your Savior. And this is why the book of Hebrews now introduces you to Him as your High Priest. Because if you're going to live in this hostile world, and you need the help that can only come from the divine, then we need to know Jesus as our high priest as well. Listen, when Jesus died on the cross, was laid in the grave, and on the third day he rose again, what did he do after that? He, he, he was seen by his followers, is that right? And then the Bible tells us in the book of Acts that he stayed here with them for like another 40 days, right? But what did he do after that? Did he go home and take a vacation? Yeah. Now listen, 33 and a half years, don't you think he would have deserved a vacation? Especially living here with us. What, did, what does the Bible say that he did? said that he ascended and he sat down at the right hand of the Father, right? The book of Hebrews gives you a little more information and insight of what Jesus has been doing since he ascended. And the book of Hebrews shows him in the beginning as your Savior and then introduces him as your High Priest. Why is it so important that we have a high priest in heaven. Any ideas? We need a lawyer. We need, yeah. we need a lawyer. <laughs> I, I like that, but I like the word mediator better. We need a mediator between sinful men and a holy God. And Jesus Christ is that mediator, right? He is our high priest. So you got to ask yourself, what's he actually doing in that role? And how does it affect you and I in our day-to-day -day lives? Because when the Sabbath is over and tomorrow comes, if God gives me breath, I have to go to work. And the next day, I have to go to work. And so on and so forth until Friday night comes in here, right? And in my work, I have certain things that have to be done the same day, every week, week in, week out, and then there's extra stuff, okay? So you have to try to figure all this out in your schedule. What does Christ's mediation in heaven as my high priest mean for me in my day-to-day -day life? Because all of us have responsibilities, is that right? All of us have things we got to do or responsibilities we got to take care of. How does Christ in his work as our high priest, interact with our day-to-day -day lives. Any ideas? That's a tough question, isn't that? This is why in our Sabbath school class, I try to focus that Jesus has to be real to you, and he has to, your relationship with him has to be just like your relationship with your husband, the relationship and the friendship between Rosa and I. It has to be real, it has to be tangible. Jesus as my high priest, number one, I need to know what a high priest does. Why it was important for him to be a high priest. So let's go back and let's look at these set of verses. Hebrews 4, verse 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our What's that next word? Confession. In Christ, what is our confession? 
So I told you kids, I was raised uh, from a child to uh, throughout my teenage years in the Catholic Church. Confession there was a whole different thing, right? What does this word here mean? Confession. That we are to hold fast our confession. It says profession. Okay, what version do you read from? Okay, so the, I've got the New King James. So this says profession. You got the New King James as well? What does your say? Confession. Confession? You want to make sure I'm reading it right. But listen, so profession or confession. What does that have to do with your relationship with Christ? And why are you to hold fast to it? Okay? Faith in Him, I like that. Gary? It's our allegiance. Our allegiance to Him. So, first of all, you've got to take the context of what Hebrews was written about in two. And realize that that book was written because uh, Hebrew Christians were leaving Christ and going back to the temple, as I said, in the Sabbath school class. Okay? Now, the writer of Hebrews is telling them to hold fast their profession or confession. Okay? We have to, day by day, hour by hour, hold fast to Jesus Christ. And we cannot allow anything else to come into our hearts to take the place that only He is due. Amen? Amen? Jesus, in the book of Revelation, is described as King of Kings in what? Is there anything higher in authority than Jesus Christ? For us in our lives, we are to hold fast our profession and our confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. He is the Savior of the world, and He is my only hope in this life of being able to live for God and to share Christ with others. Amen? Amen. So, going back to our text, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, our profession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot, what's that next word? Sympathize with our what? Now, how many of you guys know intimately human weakness? Uh, every hand should be raised, because those of you who are not really getting you didn't hear me, or you're lying. <laughs> human weakness, it's something that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But listen. This is why it is so important that we have a high priest who understands our weaknesses. But it goes even farther than that. That this high priest understands what I go through in my day-to-day -day life. He understands the temptations that I face. But it's more than that. Not only does he understand, but what he went through, <coughs> he was able to overcome this world. The Bible says that Jesus had how much sin? Zero. Zero. Absolutely none. He never sinned. Now, coming from a background of Catholicism, they taught me that that's because he couldn't sin. Because he was divine. Okay? Was the temptations that Jesus went through, were they real? Yes. Could he have succumbed to them? Yes. Could he have fallen? Yes. Do you understand that it had to be that way? Because if it wasn't that way, if what I was taught in Catholicism was true, then he doesn't know what it's like to be me. Nor can I look to him for strength because... Now listen, in Catholicism, this is why you have the intercession of saints. And this is why Mary is elevated to where she's at. Because they taught me that Christ couldn't identify with me. He was so far up here that I needed Mary to help me get to Him. Is that scriptural? No. So listen, do you understand why it's so important that you have a high priest who knows what it's like for you to go through what you go through every day of your life? When you go to work Monday, 
and you start getting the texts. You get the text, you get to your office, and then the phone doesn't stop ringing, then your boss calls you into the office. <sighs> and that's just Monday. There's Tuesday, <laughs> Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday after that. What Jesus is doing there will give you the strength to deal with all of that and to deal with it in the meekness of Christ and in the power of Christ. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> For we do not have a high priest, this is the first 15 of chapter 4, who cannot sympathize. Don't you know that word, sympathize? The fact that God, the creator of the universe, this being who is able to speak everything into existence, how much power is that? I can't fathom that. I, I lay in bed at nighttime and try to grasp that thought, that this God is so powerful that he can speak things into being, and, and they come forth. And one day I'm going to meet him. I'm going to stand in front of him. And it's either going to go one of two ways. I'm either going to be scared to death and pray that I die before I see him. Or embrace him with the love that he's embraced me in this life. Amen? Because God is able to sympathize with me, it gives me hope. It gives me strength. And it gives me courage, because brothers and sisters, I need courage. When I leave here today, and I go to work tomorrow, and I realize that, you know, I'm a pastor, and all that entails, and, you know, everyone looks at me and waits, you know, not you guys, but the people that I work with. And, you know, they, they don't accept God, but... It's so funny how this works. They don't accept God, but they're waiting for me to mess up. Yeah. So they can tell me just how unreal this thing of God is. There's a lot of pressure, a lot of responsibility. And in this fallen human this. Without Christ and without that courage, I couldn't do this. And I wouldn't have the strength to get up and do what I need to do tomorrow and the next day, next day, next day, next day. Okay? Let alone deal with my family, my children, you guys. Do <laughs> 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 you understand that again? When? The Bible says that we are family. I believe that. Yeah. But I also know that you guys have a place in my heart that my own family don't have because you don't see them here, right? Yeah. I don't I don't find my strength in Christ through them because they don't share the same things that, that, yeah. that you and I do. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And if you weren't here, I wouldn't be here either. Understand that? This is why together, together we need each other. This is why in further on in the book of Hebrews, it says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as has become the manner of some of you. Okay? I need you. We need each other. Yes. And it is because of you guys and what you offer to me that keeps me coming back here. You guys understand that? But that is all based on Christ being my Savior and my High Priest and knowing that He's able to sympathize with me. But listen, if this was the bar and all I was ever told is you have to reach this bar and if you don't reach this bar there's no hope, no help, and you're not worthy, I would have probably committed suicide. Okay. But Christ understands my weaknesses. Amen. But he doesn't leave me in my weaknesses. Do you guys understand that? That in Jesus Christ, because he is my high priest, he offers strength, he offers power, and he offers hope. And isn't that what we need? Especially in our day in 2017, do we not need hope? 
hope for something better? Hope for power to overcome all the deception and the darkness that is out there today. This is today. That's going to happen tomorrow. Okay? But because Jesus is my high priest, because he didn't go home to take a vacation, because he went back to heaven and day one went right back to work for me, I have confidence that I'm able to approach God's throne boldly. Boldly. That's an amazing statement. Let's continue to read. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points, what's that next word? Tempted as we are. I love that, but I love the next part of this verse even more. Listen. He was tempted in all points like I am. Why? Because he took on the same human nature that I have. And in doing so, he's able to understand what it's like for me in this to deal with life in this world. But listen, the best thing about this is that he did not fall. Amen. He was perfect. And because of his perfection, I now find strength in my weakness. What did Paul say about God, Paul's strength, in his weakness? Any ideas? Hey, you guys want this? What did you say? In his weakness, it made him stronger. Say it loud. In his weakness, it made him stronger. Paul was able to state that in his weaknesses, in his infirmities, then the power of God was able to shine forth. Why? Because Paul in that state was fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. And it was no longer a battle between Paul's will and Christ's will. Paul sitting on the throne of his heart and Christ sitting on the throne. It was Christ and Christ alone. And that Paul became a vessel of Jesus Christ. So that when the world saw Paul, didn't you ever find it strange that Paul says, I want you to obey my gospel? You know that verse, right? You know that verse? How is Paul able to say that with a good conscience? I would never say that. Do you understand how close Paul and Jesus were? Do you understand that when Paul preached, it wasn't Paul, it was Christ? Paul said in Galatians 2.20, Ricky read that for Sabbath school class today, right? That Paul was crucified with Christ, but yet he was still living. But it was no longer Paul living, but it was Christ living in, through Paul. And so what Jesus wanted done, Paul did it. Because Paul's thoughts and Christ's thoughts were like that. Isn't that what we want as well? Yes. I told you this before. It's like, you guys said better older. Do you remember your AM radios in the car? Uh, you remember trying to find stations? And you had to take that dial and just dial it in, and it had to be just right, or else, man, you get all kind of uh, interference and stuff. That's the same way it is with your connection with God. God through Christ, Christ is able to dial us in to where the frequencies of our lives are on God's radio station, and that the message that comes through us is not us, but it's Jesus Christ. But what this world does is try to take that dial, move it to the left, move it to the right, so that you start getting that interference and that static. Okay? But Christ is your high priest. is always there to dial you back in. So that as you continue to grow and mature in Jesus Christ, then it becomes your thoughts, his thoughts, now one. That's what the world is waiting to see. And for Jesus Christ to come back, that will be the condition of his people when he comes. Amen? Amen. So Christ was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Now, 
He was tempted in all points as we are, but were, you know, are we tempted in all points as he was? No. What he went through and the temptations that he had to endure as the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice, we can never even fathom. And yet he did all of that and never sinned. I always thought it strange that Jesus had to wake up early in the morning, a long time before the sun rose, to pray. Why? He was gone. But yet he needed to find strength. He needed to find the will of his Father for that day. Why did he have to pray so much? And why does the Bible that he had to learn say that he had to learn obedience? It goes back to him and his humanity, right? Do you understand that this is what separates Jesus from every other person who's lived on this planet? Jesus was fully human and fully divine. It wasn't a half and half thing. He was fully human, fully divine, and had both of those natures encapsulated in one body. Now, if you had the power to turn bread, or to turn stones into bread, and you had eaten for many, many days, would you do that? How tempting would that be for you? Even before the devil said to come and, and do this, to show that you're the Son of God. Listen, did Jesus ever use his divinity to help him overcome in this life? So then the question must be asked, how did he overcome? Was, was he really tempted like you and I are? Have you guys ever been tempted? Have you ever really been tempted? Okay, so he could say the same thing. How did he overcome? He overcame by the relationship that he had with his Father and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that it is best for me to go because if I go, I will send you a what? Comforter. Another comforter. Who is that comforter? Holy Spirit. And where does that Spirit live now if you're a follower of Christ? What's the difference between what Jesus had and what he's given to us? Yes? Um, I'm in a little bit of disagreement with you on the fully divine. The disciples had the same uh, power to heal, even, even before, even as they were sinners. Christ called on the Holy Spirit from God when he was here. He laid aside his divinity when he was here. If he didn't, then he wouldn't have been tempted in all points as we are. Okay, now going back to our verse, let's go to chapter 4, verse 16. When Jesus went and ascended into heaven, he became our high priest, he now tells us something that is striking. He says that we can approach God how? In fear? Oh. 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 Doesn't that sound strange? That we are able to approach the Father boldly. What's the difference between boldly and presumption? You know what the difference is? A true relationship with Jesus Christ. Right? Right? Because there are a lot of people who presume to approach God in the right manner. And you're probably going to be surprised on that last day. But listen, the Bible does say that we can boldly approach God. How do we do that? Because Jesus is our high priest. And he mediates between us and God. And if Jesus is your mediator, could you ask for a better one? Think about it. Do you realize that as a Christian, everything has been stacked in your favor? Listen, uh, there's many of us who are afraid of that judgment. You know what I'm saying? That, that when your name comes up, that judgment. But in that judgment, 
Who is your defense attorney? Jesus. Who's the lawyer and the prosecutor? Jesus. Wow, so the prosecutor who is standing there trying to uh, uh, convict you is also your lawyer and advocate who's trying to get you, to set you free. Doesn't that sound good for you? Yeah. Yes. Right? This is why it's so important that you fathom, grasp, understand what this relationship with Christ really is. That it is not just a religion. When I was going to church through uh, Catholicism, that's all I was doing was going to church. I had no conception of who Jesus Christ was. And it was, I had no idea what the gospel meant. But when I started to go to Protestant churches and actually started hearing the Bible, and then started reading it for myself, and I started to understand just what it meant to accept Jesus as my personal Savior, what He did for me. And then to find out it wasn't just for me, but it was for all humanity. Then I started to understand what Christ offers me. Who I am in the sight of God when He sees me and all that I've done in the past. And He sees all that I'll do in the future. And I can come boldly to His throne. Um, turn with me to 1 John. First John chapter 2. Now we're going to read this verse with the thought of Christ being our high priest. That he was tempted in all manner that we were, but yet he was without sin. First John chapter 2 verse 1. How does John put this? He goes, my what? Don't you love that? My little children. These things I write to you so that you may not what? Never forget that. What is he saying here? I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Right? That's the goal. And it's an attainable and achievable goal in Jesus Christ. But it's only in Christ. But what I know from my experience is that that's what I want. That's where I want to be. But there are days when that's not what the reality is, right? Am I by myself or is there anybody here that can amen that? Amen. So John gives you hope and assurance because your judge is also your advocate. But never forget that first part, because in Christ we have all the power and all the strength that we can ever need to live a life that is pleasing to Him. Never forget that. So as we go on and read, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an, what's that word? Advocate, Advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And He Himself is the, oh, that's a big word. Propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for what? The whole, the whole world. For the whole world. So, seeing then that we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with all of our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Jesus Christ is our all in all. Everything in this life that you need, that you want, can be found in Him. The difference is, is whether you're looking at him through the fallen flesh or through the reborn spirit. The Bible tells us over and over again that we are not to live in this flesh, but we are to live in what? 
the Spirit. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Okay? And being born again means that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, but also as your Lord. And that is no longer you who make the decisions for your life, but it is Him.